morning once again and um, we are continuing our study through the book of John chapter 6. We have taken a detour from the gospel of Mark and last week we looked at how the people responded to Jesus thinking about him as that son of Joseph. Today the Jews are once again arguing against among themselves, not about the status of Jesus as a poor person or somebody whose family background isn't noble or respectable, but they were arguing because he said that he's given up himself for the world and the world has to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I believe the Jews were outraged because it didn't make sense. It did not make a single sense that they would eat the flesh of another human or drink the blood of another human. Personally, I believe if I were there at that moment, I would also be outraged by the fact that this person is offering his flesh and blood to me. But we have to take a time travel back to the Old Testament and look at the Jewish laws and rites of purity and cleanliness. The book of Leviticus prohibits the Jews from eating blood because the life of every creature is in its blood. Therefore, there was no discussion about whether we can eat the flesh. The, there was no discussion about whether we can drink the blood of any animal because it was prohibited by the Mosaic law. There's also another thing about eating flesh. Indeed, you, we may not find directly any scriptural quote, uh, uh, passage that prohibits eating of human flesh. But that this is not mentioned doesn't mean we cannot read from scripture that we are not supposed to eat human flesh. Firstly, the Bible prohibits killing of another person. Therefore, we cannot kill a human in order to get uh, flesh to eat. Secondly, the laws of Moses prohibit people from touching the corpses of dead people and makes provision for even when people have to touch dead people, how they have to clean themselves and get themselves to be part of the community again. Again, eating of human flesh happens to be a curse from God when we read Leviticus 26, 27 to 30. And it says, if you refuse to listen to me, and if you still turn against me, then I will sh surely show my anger. Yes, myself, I will punish you seven times for your sin. You will become so hungry that you will eat the bodies of your sons and daughters. So eating of flesh has no place in the Jewish life. Let us go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 verse 16 tells us that we have been given everything in the garden to eat. Every tree is good to eat, except for the tree of good and evil. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 3, after the flood, God said to Noah, Now you are able to eat every moving creature on the face of the earth and all vegetation. The distinction between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 9 is that humans were vegetarian in Genesis chapter 1. But in Genesis chapter 9, we are now given rights to eat both vegetables and animals. In verse 4 to 6 of the same Genesis chapter 9, we find out that God even demanded accounts from humans and animals that killed other humans. So on the issue of eating uh, the flesh of a human, there is no theological argument to support it at all. So the Jews have a right to be angry and outraged at what Jesus said. The laws of Moses for that still gives right uh, laws on what we can eat and not eat. So when we look at the whole of the Old Testament, we can see food that we are allowed and not, and those that we are not. So the Jews were rightly, were rightly and justifiably allowed to be outraged by Jesus telling them of the flesh and blood. But when we listen deeper, we know that Jesus Christ is the one that turns everything upside down. He was not actually talking of his flesh and his blood in real time, like eating of his 
body. But he was saying something deep, something powerful. The Bible said where we looked in the Old Testament that the life of every creature is in their blood. Therefore, Christ is offering himself up for us just like those sacrifices that had to be made in the days of old. The blood of the animal had to be spilled and sprinkled on the altar. And that is what Christ is saying, that I will die just like those animals of sin offering, of guilt offering, that needs to be killed so that the Israelites will be declared free from the anger of God. And that is what Christ is saying. His flesh is that, uh, the, the flesh of that animal that had to be killed so that others will be redeemed. So this is very important. That Christ was not talking about him giving his body for people to eat. Because that wouldn't have satisfied the whole world. I mean, the Jews of that time, if they actually ate the flesh and blood of Christ, it would have finished in that moment. But the redemptive work of Christ continues. It goes beyond the physical. It's about a spiritual rejuvenation. Therefore, we ask, what is the nature of the giving up of the flesh and blood of Christ? Over many years, people have argued about the issue of the atonement. What does it mean? What is the, the, the crux of the matter? There are seven theories of what the nature of the dying of Christ is. One is the moral influence theory, the ransom theory, the satisfaction theory, the penal substitution theory, the governmental theory, the scapegoat theory, and Christus Victor. I will not bother us to go deep into these theories, but I will, I will say that this place we read today brings forth the substitutionary nature of the death of Christ, that he took our place to redeem us. That he is standing on our behalf, he died for us. He that was no sin became sin, so that we might be declared free from sin. Therefore, Christ stood on your behalf. Christ took your pain. Christ took your tears. Therefore, cry no more. When you find yourself in difficult situations, place it on the blood of Christ. When sickness and pain and grief are so much, place it on Christ. Because that was the reason why he died. So we have a consolation that Christ has suffered our shame. Therefore, we cannot be put to shame anymore. Because the Bible said, by his stripes, we have been made whole. Having established this nature, that part of what Christ did was to take our place in dying. Now, does the Eucharist we celebrate have any direct link to this passage we read today? When Jesus was saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood, was Christ saying, behold the Eucharist? Some people would say yes. Others would say no. Some people would say it's complicated. Others would say it is consequential. Let us look at this a bit. For people who look towards Rome, that is people who are more Anglo-Catholic in their understanding of Scripture, they will say that Jesus was talking about the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Jesus was making an, uh, an acclamation of what will happen. For the second group, they will say that this has no direct link with the Eucharist. Because the death of Christ was to save humans, and the Eucharist was only a reminder. The third people will say it is complicated. And funny enough, <laughs> this is what we usually see in the Church of England. I'm making a joke. Because we try to hold together a lot of theologies and try to understand together as a church. But there's a fourth group. This group says that the Eucharist is consequential to this passage. In as much as it perhaps does not have a direct link, but what Christ did and said comes to life at the Eucharist in our understanding. The Eucharist is a sacrament. And I will quote from the Catechism of the Book of Common Prayer. The, the, a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given to us, ordained by Christ himself, as a means whereby we receive the same and pledge to assure us thereof. Therefore, a sacrament is telling of a spiritual thing that Christ has done. The Eucharist reminds us of the redemptive work of God. So the Eucharist brings forth, reminds us that what Christ has done many years is still alive 
and still working for us today. Therefore, we must have in mind that what Christ is doing doesn't end. And the nature of this Eucharist has been argued whether we can actually meet Christ in real terms in the Eucharist or is it a spiritual connection. Let me read to you what Archbishop Cranmer said. The Romans say that, a good man eat the, that, a, that good men eat the body of Christ and drink his blood only at the time when they receive the sacrament. We say that they eat and drink and feed on Christ continually as long as they are members of his body. They say the body of Christ, which is in the sacrament, has its own proper form and quantity. We say that Christ, there is, that Christ is there sacramentally and spiritually without form and quantity. They say the fathers and, and prophets of old did not eat the body and, or, nor drink the blood of Christ. We say they did eat his body and drink his blood, although he was not born or incarnate. So it is important for us to know that in coming to the Eucharist, it's not simply to meet Christ in the bread or the wine, but to get into the union of Christ. Because some people have said that the uh, bread is simply Christ, and the blood and the wine we drink is simply the blood. But this is more nuanced than it appears. Because some people have eaten the Eucharist without meeting Christ. Because when you take the Eucharist into yourself, there should be a change in your spirit. There should be a change in lifestyle. There should be a change in perspective. And if this is not taking place, perhaps we have not met Christ. And for some people who might not have received the Eucharist, this doesn't mean that they have not met Christ. Let us remember that man on the cross with Jesus. And Jesus said to him, to de- to him Today you will be with me in paradise. That man never ate the Eucharist. But there was a transformation in his life because feeling on Christ is beyond and above eating bread and wine, but a spiritual connection that we have with God. Since the pandemic, some of us have not been able to receive uh, the Eucharist in its full form. Some others have not even been able to come out because they are either shielded or some other thing. Does this mean that they are not in union with Christ? Does this mean they are not feeding on the flesh and blood of Christ? I think not. I think that the Eucharist reminds us and gives us room to encounter Christ. But having said this, we must surely reject the idea and the traditions that downplay the Eucharist as another act we do in church, that make it trivial, that make it simple, or that make it have no value. This is not what the mind of Christ is. The Eucharist is a gift to the church. It's the most holy thing we have in the church of today. And that is why we must treat it with dignity and honor. We must pay attention to what Christ is doing. And we should not trivialize or come to the Lord's table in an unholy manner. Paul said, some of you have died because you have come to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. So let us have this consolation that this blood that was given up for us redeems us. That whether we eat the Eucharist or not, the most important thing is what the Eucharist points to, who the Eucharist is all about, the redemptive work of Christ that he has invited us to become part of. I pray that our lives will be transformed by coming to the Lord's table. Because indeed, people have met Christ at the Eucharist. People's lives have been changed. People have received healing, transformation when they came to the table of the Lord. I pray that as you come to the table today, come with faith, come with belief that Christ is present in his church, that Christ can touch you and redeem you and do new things. Let us have this in mind. Faith is in the death of Christ is very essential in the Eucharist. Thus, we are being invited to eat his flesh and drink his blood, not just in church, but on the streets, in our homes, in our offices, when we sit in the cafe to drink tea and coffee. Feed on Christ. Let us pray. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. 
Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of Christ that was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.